Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you that you have given, taken time out of our busy schedules, Lord, to to work for the great people of Georgia. Lord, just help us be open-minded, help us to listen, Lord, and help us continue to represent the people of Georgia. In God's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, these are going to be hearings today, and the reason uh, the two bills are hearings because um, Lynn Riley, who is with the Student Finance Commission, is tied up over in a hearing in the House, and um, they wanted to be here, so we, we, we're going to just uh, do that. So, um, not not to go in any particular order, but uh, uh, the rules chairman has a little more higher priority than the rest of us. So we're going we're going to listen to the rules chairman first. But let, before we can do that, let, let me mention a couple of quick things to you. Um, and we go we got some literacy people here today. Don't uh, go and speak, which is great. Uh, if everything, just to bring everybody up to date, uh, y'all know we we were meeting with a um, joint. joint committee. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> joint between the uh, education committee and the higher education committee. And we had four in unbelievable meetings, and we received a lot of information. We learned a lot. And so if everything goes right, we will have a uh, we will have the bill this afternoon. Uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 so we've already run it. We've already bedded it by. Um, by our people, we 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 uh, the lieutenant uh, excuse me the governor's office uh, has read it. They're they're okay with it. So we're gonna start getting signatures in the morning, and we should hopefully we'll drop it. You know, early part of the week, maybe even tomorrow. Um, so y'all stay informed on that. Uh, as as y'all well know, our Republican caucus and and I know now uh, uh, all the Democrats feel the same way. This is such a highly highly issue, important issue that's got got to be addressed and got to be um, up here. Everybody asked me. I've stopped in the hall and they said, "What, what what's the answer?" I said. I don't know the answer, then, but 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 we but we're gonna find out what the answer is. We just know there's a problem, and there's a lot bigger problem. Everybody knew there was a problem, but nobody wanted to speak about the problem. And now we brought it out, and we we we've, we've addressed the issue. So we're gonna go forward with. It. So thank you, and um, Mr. Rule Chairman, would you uh, mind going first? Oh, <laughs> I didn't realize you were that nice. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And we're working off of, of I'm at this mic. Yeah, yeah. We're, wait, we're working off Senate Bill um, 86. Whenever you're ready, we're ready. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I think y'all are actually looking at a substitute, but um, and there's going to be more changes. So I actually do appreciate the hearing right. only because the bill is not quite ready to move. But uh, we'll we'll talk about a little bit of that. But let me first talk about the importance of this and why we need this. Um, you know, we we continue to hear that there's a workforce shortage in this state. And, um, you know, I think it's time that we start looking at our at, at high school kids and specifically our juniors and our seniors um, as as part of the workforce. And currently they're not being counted as that and specifically our dual enrollment kids. Uh, these dual enrollment kids are, um, you know, these students learn skills and earn credentials that get them into the workforce faster and so what this the overarching idea here is to get them into the workforce even faster. Um, you know, in order to have a competitive workforce, dual enrollment programs designed in partnership with employer workforce needs, they're going to have to continue to be developed and offered to our high school students. Now, over the summer, the Governor's Healthcare Workforce Commission made lots of recommendations specifically around workforce. Uh, and one of those recommendations was to optimize dual enrollment opportunities for high school students and create secondary and post-secondary education collaborations that make better use of the state dual enrollment and hope career grant funding available for students. Now, there's two examples where we could see an immediate impact and um, an immediate need for this. Uh, down in Doherty County, the Phoebe Putney Health System at their 4C College and Career Academy, which is the Commander Conyers, Commodore Conyers College and Career Academy, 
uh, in Albany Technical College, they created a CNA nursing path for students to get their CNA in the 11th grade, work at Phoebe in the 12th grade, and then use 30 hours of dual enrollment for academic core into Albany State nursing programs. So accessing the HOPE Career Grant prior to exhausting their 30 hours of dual enrollment is going to allow these students to gain valuable industry experience while they're still in, in high school. Uh, it's going to also enable them to enter the workforce upon graduation with credentials and significant work experience. Now, in my hometown, my home county, Coweta County, um, I've got the grandfather of all college and career academies here with me, Mark Whitlock, uh, who heads up our CEC, which is our Coweta College and Career Academy. Um, we partnered, or they partnered, with the Advanced Manufacturing, or we have the Advanced Manufacturing Technician Program, which is a partnership between our local manufacturers, the CEC, our College and Career Academy, and our West Georgia Technical College. And so these students need 30 hours or more of HOPE grant for technical instruction starting in 10th grade and reserve the dual enrollment to complete academic core instruction that is not paid for by the HOPE grant. So if you look in your bill, um, look on in section one there, and I think it's, did my lines change from these? If you look at lines, I believe it's 22 through 27. It may have changed in this up, but around there, that's really the the meat, the meat and the potatoes of this bill. And, and it's is is where it's essentially is going to allow these eligible high school students to access the Hope Career Grant for approved CTAE courses, which are, you know, the designated courses that are, are high needs um, courses, uh, high career pass, high needs career pass. Anyway, prior to reaching their 30 hour dual enrollment. And that's that's uh that's, it's just gonna be critical. That's the that's the meat and potatoes of this bill, as I stated. Um now lines 28 through 51, this is on the data reporting. Um, and the data reporting is gonna be essential so that we we're creating a sustainable program. We obviously don't want to create some program that's gonna run out of money in the next few years. So um in order to get the uh, get us to a point where we can get it sustainable, we need to we need to understand exactly what the what we're doing, how the how this these changes are going to affect the students, and how fast they can move along in the program. Um, so, and then, and we did, and that's in the substitute the changes. Um, you know, we working with Commissioner Lynn Riley. We uh, over at student finance, there was some of the data that we had listed that they actually don't have access to. Um, so we we in the substitute, we brought along the technical college system because they they have some of that data. So um, there's just certain data points we've got to we're, we're going to need to have to to create this sustainable program. Um, now, 40, line 46 through 51 is is we're going to report annually the governor, the Office of Planning and Budget, and the General Assembly. The re report will monitor student use of dual enrollment opportunities and the creation of programs that maximize dual enrollment to get students faster into the workforce. Um, lines 56 through 67, um, this is why I'm glad we're doing a hearing only. We're actually going to take that piece out. Um, and then section two altogether is going to come out. And so what we hope to do is on top of on top of uh, allowing going ahead and allowing these kids to access the Hope Career Grant uh, for these specific courses um, and and collecting the data in conjunction with that. We also want to come back with a study committee um, and, and figure out a long term solution. Um, this is a this is a great short term solution that's going to help programs like in at Phoebe down in Doherty County, and it's going to help my home county in Coweta County and the programs that we have there. Um, and then I think you're if you have any counties that you represent that participate in the Georgia CAT program, um, they will benefit from this as well, and we will see them jump on. So um, I do have some folks here i know that i don't know if they're signed up but um some experts in this field we could they bring are. up for questions but i'll be more than happy to take questions this, at um, this moment this, 
Let's take a couple of questions. I think is it Senator Parent or Senator Jones or Senator Beach? I'm number six. Okay. Senator Beach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Brass, thank you for this. I, I I really believe in this dual enrollment program. It's a great program. It's benefited a lot of my constituents. Um, and I do like, I want to ask you a question. I, I like that you're going to collect and report on data and you've got like A, B, C, and D and mm -hmm. E. And I want to ask you about E on line 42. If I'm reading this correct, this would really see what students we track if they got a job in these high demand careers. Is that what that, if I'm reading that, the number of students employed in the high demand field after completing a program of study included on the HOPE Career Grant Program? Mm -hmm. So would we track and see if they, they got jobs in those fields that we need jobs in is that is that what that's that, my understanding that's okay. correct yeah i think that's important to have a success and and kind of a report card if you will to see hey do we want right. to keep doing this and if it's if it's really helping the the careers that we're right. having a hard time filling well then I'm, I, we may want to double up on this right and take it a step further is we, we want to make sure they're staying in georgia too yeah you know we don't want to pay for all this education and then run off to you know okay. canada or something well, well, thank you. Thanks for bringing this good bill. Senator Harrell? Or is no. Oh, okay. Senator, there we go. Senator Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the, to the distinguished senator from the 28th. Thank you. Ben Welcome Duke, to higher education, Biddy. The man that needs no microphone. That's exactly right. <laughs> Spent too many years in the classroom, Mr. Chairman. I understand. Um, I, again, I support the bill. I support the concept of the bill. I think it's a great way to transition from high school into the workforce or into higher education. Uh, hope funds for uh, dual enrollment are limited to 30 hours. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And would this be this this use of these additional funds? Would this be an addition uh, to that? Uh, hold, let me bring can it, bring, oh, bring Mr. Chairman. Would you allow me bring, to just bring, bring experts up, up to either Mr. Yeah. Hatcher or, or Mr. Whitlock? Which are one you want to bring? Dual enrollment's limited. I need a whole hours. team. But, the, but you that got is team. supported. Dual enrollment. Right. There we go. I, 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 oh. yeah, my hey, question hey. is, does this e extend dual enrollment opportunities from 30 hours to beyond 30 hours? Not dual enrollment. Uh, it, it does provide access to HOPE. Uh, the HOPE Career Grant is what we're looking to do. Okay, so, so, so the, the dual enrollment component is left intact. Is that correct? That's correct. And then this would allow for hope grant opportunities for CTAE courses in high demand fields. Is that correct? That's correct. Currently, uh, uh, students can access their hope career grant while in high school after they exhaust their 30 hours they of dual can. enrollment. All we're looking to do is have them able to access that HOPE career grant prior to exhausting those 30 hours so they can go ahead and start working on these technical skill, skills and actually get an internship where they can have a meaningful internship with those skills while they continue their 30 hours of dual enrollment. Thank you. I, yep. I, I, I totally uh, uh, support the concept mm -hmm. of the technical skills training and then the, the work experience that goes with that. I just wanted to understand how the dual enrollment component and the hope grant component would would uh, connect we're hold the hope the 30 hours of dual enrollment we're is is is, setting. is is in is intact is that's that right. correct that's right thank you thank you mr chairman can, can i can i add to that senator yes Perfect. sir and it, not only does the 30 hours stay intact but the time period when dual enrollment can start remains intact you can't start academic degree level core courses until the 11th grade we're not changing that okay. thank you in order to get through really rigorous programs like I, I think you've got a copy of this the one that that chairman brass referred to georgia cat in order to get through that we have to start in the 10th grade mm -hmm. to start in the 10th grade means if we can get to hope grant funds we can get started on those technical courses of study and reserve that 30 hours of dual enrollment till 11th and 12th grade to get into the academic degree level core. Our students who have completed the associate degree move even faster than those who don't, who complete the certificates. 
in, in terms of their career. And we've, we've got data to show that. Yes, sir. Any, any other questions about the committee? Oh, okay. Number 13, 11. Okay. And um, I guess this would be to the grand, <clears throat> excuse me, the grandfather of college and career academies. What year was that started? We, we started in the year 2000. 2000. Okay. So the, the funding for this is, uh, is going to be, you know, it's, it's more money to do it and, and I'm all for it, but, but that's the question. Do we know how much money would be involved in this? Well, actually, uh, Senator, um, students are already able to access their HOPE career grant mm -hmm. while in high school. So we're not at, it's not going to cost anymore. So we're holding the, not, not expanding dual enrollment. So we're maintaining 30 hours of dual enrollment. They already can access their HOPE career grant while in high school. So we're not asking any more there. We're simply asking that they be able to do that prior to that 30 hours being exhausted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if it, if it's, so this goes against their and, hope. And they no, still have a cap on They this, still right? have a There's cap. There's still a cap. So There's they would exhaust that just a little bit earlier, potentially. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a sixty-three well, hour cap on the hope grant. That's not changed either. Okay. Yeah. Um, as I reminded y'all earlier, and I think for the ones that came in late, this is just a hearing only because the student finance commission also wants to talk about this. And so we will have it have it up for a vote next Wednesday. Correct. And um, just for the record, too, Mr. Chairman, um, and I touched on a little bit, but can, we have been working with Commissioner Riley. She did come to us early with right. with some concerns, and we walked through that, and we've um, we've addressed some of them, and we're going to continue to work with her. But uh, at the end of the day, I, I think we're going we're in a good spot. Uh, before we leave, Senator Byrne, one follow up question, Mr. Chairman, if I could. Uh, this is a a pilot program, is that correct, or does it? I see a date on it of 26. That how to explain that component of it for me, please. Well, we uh, the governor's office had asked for a sunset, so we we are putting a sunset on it. So the sunset is there. Uh, to it's not to a provide, pilot program though. This will be statewide. This will be a statewide. It's this not a pilot statewide. program. Now, um, I mean, you could you could almost think of it as a pilot program because in the beginning you're. More, most likely only going to have a few counties uh, that are t taking advantage of this. Um, Doherty County, Coweta County being two of the two of the leaders on that. But it will um, be available. But it will be available. Uh, and and as soon as it catches on, I'm pretty sure it'll be it'll be taken advantage of in a good way. Thank you. Oh, uh, one last question. Senator Moore. Is that? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the distinguished. Mr. Rules Chairman, I think this is a, a great piece of legislation. Um, I love career technical agriculture education. Um, one of the things that I hope for as the state moves forward is that students are able to complete coursework when they graduate high school and, and not have to worry about spending the next two years or three years of their life in a technical college. So can, can you tell me how this piece of legislation helps students finish and be done with their accreditations uh, when they graduate, and and this doesn't just, um, you know, there's a sunk cost if you take all these classes, and does this lure students into technical colleges, or does this help them be finished when they finish in 12th grade? Yeah, thank you for the question, and I'll, I'll address it from a healthcare standpoint. So the, the way uh, our healthcare program and, and working with our, our partners at Phoebe, trying to get qualified students into the workforce sooner. So that was the objective with this. In looking at the dual enrollment rules, a lot of these students, Phoebe would like for them to become uh, ASNs and RNs eventually. So the technical education, if we're able to offer that in, you know, prior to them exhausting their 30 hours, they will get their CNA, their their junior year, they will continue with their 30 hours of dual enrollment, working towards their ASN. They will have a full year of an internship opportunity at Phoebe their senior year while they work on that core. And then they'll be able to enter the workforce as a CNA and continue their education to become an RN uh, right thereafter. So they've got about 40 more hours after high school to become that uh, that ASN, but they've already got their CNA when they leave. They've already got a year's worth of work experience and they are on their way. So it is absolutely a way to compress 
that calendar and get them where they're making real money, having real impact uh, as an RN at a very early age. Very good. Answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Thank y'all. Um, we we going we got some other speakers, so we're gonna stop here and then we'll look for y'all back next Wednesday. That'd be great. And we'll vote on it next Wednesday. And the Student Finance Commission will be here also. So thank y'all, Mr. Mr. Whitlock and uh, Mr. Hatcher. Thank y'all for being thank here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here. Sir, the parents. Thank yeah. you, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, this bill, uh, SB 52, is a good one to hear, actually, after the presentation by the rules chairman, because it it is within the same topic area, although it accomplishes different things. Correct. But they both lean on and put forward the importance of dual education, both as a um, as an education completion tool meeting our policy goals, but also as a workforce development issue. Um, I originally filed this bill in 2020 after, the, and this predates you, um, Mr. Chairman, and a few other members of the committee, after we passed um, HB 444, which is the bill that put the 30 hour cap on dual enrollment. And the reason I filed it is because our former appropriations chairman, who we greatly miss, uh, Jack Hill, had requested a report in 2018 from the Departments of Audits and Accounts related to the dual enrollment program. Part of that came into being when we discussed and passed HB 444. But one of the things in that report that was highlighted by the Department of Audits and Accounts was a need for um for more dat more robust and um efficient and public data collection so that we could as policymakers analyze and assess the program goals and cost effectiveness and that that portion was not included in HB 444 which is why I filed this bill so we've had a couple hearings on it um, over the years. But so the entire goal really is to kind of like the data collection piece that Chairman Brass was talking about to house in one agency, Georgia Student Finance Commission, um, the collection of and reporting out of adequate and reliable data so that as policymakers, the General Assembly and the governor can make future policies in the most informed manner um, taking into account our fiduciary duty over taxpayer dollars and the program goals that have been outlined, if you do not have robust and regular data collection, you don't have an ability to analyze the program to figure out whether it's meeting your goals, which I think then calls into question whether or not we're spending taxpayer dollars in the best way to meet what the goals of the program are, which I think were outlined quite well by our prior speaker. Um, so it, it, it just assists us with being strategic in how we deploy these resources towards workforce development and, and college completion. It helps understand who is utilizing the program and how. We know that we have... Um, if you have utilization re rates that are disaggregated by a, a whole bunch of demo demographic data, then you can also see who's taking advantage and how, and then what jobs they're able to fill. All it is is uh, the gives us the ability to really make informed decisions to ensure that the program meets um, the goals. So we have in here um, the collection of the data, the regular reporting out of the data by Georgia Student Finance Commission. Uh, and I should quickly mention that it's not that there's no data related to this program, but as you heard with the prior bill, it's kind of like a little bit, it's not as comprehensive and complete and it's not housed in one place. And it's also not regularly reported out. So that that's really the difference with what we have right now. Um, so it would allow us to look at student participation rates, the rates of students earning dual credits, rates of college enrollment and graduation for students, 
who have completed one or more dual credit courses, uh, the correlation between completing one or more dual credit courses and the length of time to actually complete your college degree program, common factors in dropped, withdrawn, and failed dual credit courses attempted, measures of meeting or exceeding the program objectives and targets, and the cost savings for students, families, and the state resulting from dual credit courses taken. Now, why is that important? It's exactly as Chairman Brass said, um, in addition to build, you know, building transparency and accountability in, in this go important government program, research on dual enrollment shows that it improves college readiness, increases the rate of college enrollment and completion, helps close demographic gaps. And, you know, at heart, the more credits you can earn in dual enrollment, the research shows the more improved your college outcomes can be. And that's really the goal is um, for a lot of families, college is a heavy lift financially, even with all the great programs we have. The more you can get done in high school, the more you're ready to go right to work or um, the more easily you will be able to get those skill sets that we need in our, our uh, workforce of today. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And I know I have one speaker joining us from um, on Zoom. Okay. Uh, yes. We, anybody have any questions for us before we ask to speak? Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention. Okay. Senator Payne. Thank you for bringing this bill. Um, my question, I was looking at the breakdowns from the eighth on lines 24, I'm sorry, 23. Going forward, mm -hmm. would this be able to break down as far as, uh, I don't know if it'd be by county or by districts in Georgia, uh, the different data, you know, to measure different days by districts, or is it just going to be statewide? That's a, a great question. And yes, it would. Um, geographic location is one of the really important things. And that's on line 22. It'd be critical to, to have all these different sort of demographic pieces so that we can make sure kids from every district and rural areas and, you know, then you, or at least then we have the information right. to decide if we want to do something where we say, Hey, our participation rates are lower uh, in, in the Dalton area, you right. know, and we need to, we want to, what, what, you know, and then the policymakers either at home or, or us here could, right. could see what maybe could be done about that. Okay. Thank you. Senator Hustle. I love data. You know that. And so <laughs> I'm all for this. My question is going to be on, when we collect this, if you're wanting to see how an 11th grader, did they graduate from college or not, then you're really look, looking back six years ago, you know, it's, it's going to be old data that we're getting it may not be reflective of, of where we're at right now. So that's something I think we need to keep in mind when we say what we measure is, is try to also measure things that maybe give us a little bit quicker. That's a great point. I so, mean, you think of, I shouldn't be questioning the questioner, but um, if, we could maybe talk since we have to do hearing only um, to see if there's any anything else you know, you think would be added that because I do think whether or not they eventually complete college is a good data point. Mm -hmm. But I, I take your point and maybe there's something I mean, first of all, there's two year programs. There's, you know, one year credentialing programs mm -hmm. and then four years. So let's yeah. maybe talk a little bit more because that makes sense to me. OK. Senator Burns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I share Chairman Hofstetter's uh, desire for data and data analytics, and I appreciate this legislation. Uh, my my question relates to: Do we have uh, reasonable data now? If I look at lines fifteen and sixteen, we're we're instructing the commission to establish participation performance targets. And I would suggest that until we collect some data, how would we know what those performance and participation targets, what they, what should they be? It's, that is a fair question. I think that it certainly could be accomplished with current data and knowing what we do just about numbers in DOE. We have enough data, I think, to set that, but that is also a fair point. And the, the committee, um, I'm not suggesting that the bill does not need to be tweaked, amended, um, and that is the wisdom of our committee process, Mr. And, Chairman. And I would, I would certainly say, I, I want the uh, the commission to establish those participation and and performance targets. I do think it might be wise to give them 
a reasonable period of time to collect the data to do the analysis to then develop the uh, the participation and uh, performance targets. That's so a fair just, point, and maybe um, Commissioner Riley could, could speak to that speak one. To that. Thank yeah. you, and, and uh, I appreciate you bringing this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I got one quick question, and maybe it's, it's probably not not really related to this, but as I understand these dual enrollment children, because we, we have two sons, one did and one did not, um, the, the university college gets paid for them being there, and the school where they, high school where they it gets paid also. That's just a statement. I think that's something we need to look at, because it seems like it's a little bit too much. Okay. Um, Senator Orrick, you got a question? Thank you. Uh, to the author. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a legislation that, as you described, you've been uh, have introduced it earlier, really some years earlier. And you uh, when you when you reintroduced it at this point, you had not seen the legislation that uh, but the, the chairman brass has presented today. Correct. And that, isn't that right. And so I don't know if you've had time to see how they meshed together. Uh, I like the I think it's very important in your in your language uh that the collect that the data analysis uh disaggregated by student groups going to race gender ethnicity economic status and geographic location to really have our arms to have the really paint a clear picture of where we may be falling short um and and just fully 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 apprised eyes wide open um uh, is there how, 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 how do you see these two bills um well, it's a great question. I was um, read Chairman Brass's bill with interest. Certainly, his has a data collection piece that is more limited and has and serves a somewhat different purpose than than this. That requires data collection also within student finance to make sure it meets the objective laid out in that bill in particular. Whereas this bill is more just let's get the data without any immediate action but it, it could i was thinking i should speak with chairman brass about maybe there's a way to have them perhaps move together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or i could add a few things into his or what have you we'll just have to see how that develops okay. maybe thank the you chairman may have some ideas no that's good if you you and him work on that it'd be great but we we will vote on these bills next wednesday now we have a, a person on zoom jennifer ellis miss ellis you available uh, yes, I'm there. Can everybody see and hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I can't see you, but we can can't hear see you. Is. There you are. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee for having me today. Um, my name is Jennifer Ellis. I serve as Director of State Government Relations at All for Ed. All for Ed is a national nonprofit organization that advances policies and practices so all students graduate high school prepared to succeed in a rapidly changing world. On behalf of All for Ed, I'm pleased to offer this testimony in support of SB 52. Georgia has invested considerable finances into its dual enrollment program, and SB 52 will offer needed transparency for taxpayers and lawmakers into how this investment is allocated across the state and whether this investment is producing results for Georgia students. By tracking student results, uh, such as rates of post-secondary enrollment and persistence and cost savings achieved by dual enrollment participants, the Georgia legislature will be able to track the success of the dual enrollment program and make adjustments to ensure the program is meeting its stated aims of preparing students for college and career opportunities and ultimately successful employment. For much of the 20th century, only a high school diploma was needed to secure a good paying job, but that is no longer the reality for many students nationwide. Today, around 80% of good paying jobs require some post-secondary education and 56% require a bachelor's degree or higher. We also know that individuals with post-secondary education are far less vulnerable to economic downturns. This was recently demonstrated during the COVID recession when the unemployment rate for people with a bachelor's degree never went above 8.4%. This is compared to a rate of 17.6% for those with a high school degree but no post-secondary education. However, nationwide college enrollment is declining at an alarming rate, with the National Clearinghouse reporting a 4.2% decline in undergraduate enrollment since 2020. That's a nationwide number. 
And those students interested in pursuing post-secondary education are finding themselves unprepared for the rigor of college-level coursework. By the time students nationwide reach the 12th grade, fewer than 40% are prepared for college-level math and reading. And about 70% of students enrolling at two-year colleges require remediation to master academic content that should have been covered prior to high school graduation. The good news here is that evidence demonstrates that dual enrollment and early college opportunities increase college enrollment and college success in completion. For example, an independent evaluation found that early college students were nearly three times as likely as their peers to earn an associate's degree or certificate within six years of graduating from high school. Unfortunately, these opportunities are not available to enough students and are not equitably distributed. For many students, their zip code determines whether they have access to a robust offering of advanced and early college courses during their high school education. SB 52 would empower the Georgia Student Finance Commission to set participation and performance targets to strengthen the dual enrollment program for all students and to identify areas where the program can be tailored and strengthened by the legislature. Uh, there's a difference between expenditure and, and, and an investment, and SB 52 will help lawmakers know whether taxpayer dollars are being invested effectively to increase post-secondary completion and ultimately reduce college costs and get students into the workforce sooner and more prepared. The data points collected, tracked, and reported would detail how many students are taking advantage of Georgia dual enrollment opportunities, information about impact of dual enrollment on time and cost to complete degrees and, cert and certifications, and information about why courses are not successfully completed by participating students. This data collection will also provide critical insight into whether the benefits of this program are available to all Georgia students and will provide state lawmakers with the data to make changes and hone policies where such action is needed. In collecting, tracking, and reporting this data, Georgia would join other states that have successfully provided access to data such as this on their dual enrollment programs. Uh, two examples of that, one is Iowa, uh, through their annual condition of Iowa's Community College Report, which breaks down participation data in the state's joint enrollment program by student demographic information and average credits earned yearly. Uh, also in Ohio, uh, through their College Credit Plus annual report, which reports enrollment numbers by county, grade level, gender, race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status and disability status. And again, that's an annual report that they produce. SB 52 builds on the strong dual enrollment foundation Georgia has built and equips lawmakers with the information needed to continue to develop this program for a dynamic and changing economy and world. Alfred's pleased to endorse this important legislation, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions that remain. I think we're going to hold Yeah, great presentation. All that does is confirm what Senator Parents already told us, so we appreciate that. Um, we will cease with any questions because we got a couple of um, presenters on literacy. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you next Wednesday or tomorrow. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, we will give um, thank you, uh, Miss Ellis, too. Um, very first one, uh, we we allotted some time for our literacy uh, program. So we got the literacy lab and the science of Georgia. So we're going to give you all 10 minutes each because we need to be out of this room at three o'clock. So who's going first? Literacy Lab? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank y'all. Y'all come forward. Introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from. Oh, there's a bunch of y'all. Okay. You, okay. You got, you got 10 minutes. And I'm, I'm not trying to rush. I'm just trying to keep everybody on time and be, be, be fair. Sure. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for being here. Thank y'all for agreeing to do this. As we said earlier, this is really, we've, we've elevated through this committee and the education committee, we've, we've elevated this to the level it needs to be elevated to. So thank y'all. You know, a wash pot never boils. We know that. In the pain, I was talking about that earlier today, waiting on the elevator. I said, a wash pot never boils. That's right. <laughs> Just sits there and looks back at you. <laughs> Y'all ready? Please introduce yourself. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Higman and other members of this committee. Um, <clears throat> my name is Julius Cave. I'm the program manager for the Literacy Labs Leading Men Fellowship here in Atlanta. 
and I'll let um, everyone else introduce themselves as well. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Arielle Stokes, and I am um, one of the coaching specialists with the Literacy Labs Leading Men Fellowship Program. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dudson John Baptiste. I'm a Leading Men Fellow, a part of the Literacy Lab Program. Thank you. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, Literacy Lab as a Leading Men Fellow. I'm actually in the classroom doing. Thank you. Okay. So we'll jump in with an overview. The Literacy Lab as an organization uh, was founded in 2009 with a clear focus um, on working to provide children with individualized reading instruction in order to close the literacy gap. Um, nationally, we're in nine communities through two programs, our Reading Corps, um, as well as the Leading Men Fellowship, which is um, what we have here in Atlanta and we'll be, where we'll be focusing today. In 2016, the Leading Men Fellowship was established, um, and we launched here in Atlanta in 2022. Um, the difference here for, uh, with this fellowship program is that we saw a need not only around literacy instruction, but also to diversify the teacher um, workforce by providing young men of color the opportunity to serve as literacy tutors in pre-K classrooms. These fellows received training and coaching, um, not only in the early literacy intervention, as well as social and emotional development. And our fellows commit to serving 25 hours per week working in the classroom um, where they are paid an attractive wage of $17 an hour, as well as receiving monthly professional development and support across the fellowship. Understanding that these young men um, would need other supports, we also provide $120 a month to assist with uh, transportation and communication, um, as well as a $2,500 co college scholarship um, for our fellows. So to, to split it up, um, here's somewhat our, our services and what it looks like in the classroom. Our coaching specialist, um, Ariel, and, and as well as Dustin will be sharing more about that. Um, but just overall high level, we they uh, the fellows are in class working to implement a scripted and multi-tiers research and evidence-based curriculum. Um, they are working in a single classroom and commit to serving for a full school year in that single classroom, Monday through Friday. On the flip side of that, what we do is work with the fellows to provide some significant support and investment in their personal and professional development. Um, that looks like um, classes and discussions around financial literacy, um, mental health, as well as opportunities to be matched with mentors, as well as looking at uh, credit bearing opportunities with local colleges and universities. So while I alluded to it earlier, but just to kind of give a, a, a nice picture of it, but a three prong um, focus here. One is that understanding that in communities, uh, certain communities, we know there's opportunities to provide more literacy instruction and support these pre-K students to make sure that they're kindergarten ready. Pairing that with understanding an opportunity to provide um, more men of color um, in not only the teacher workforce, but as we think about early education, mm -hmm. as well as providing these young men uh, high quality professional opportunities. Um, and to share more about what it looks like um, in the classroom and in that curriculum, I'll turn it over to Aria. All right, thank you, Julius. So um, what we see on the screen here, we've got two hands and we like to look at that as a what we do and how we do it in the classroom. So on one hand, we see our big five early literacy predictors. Um, that is where our fellows are into the classroom to boost that oral language conversation and communication skills. They're there to boost that phonological memory and awareness, um, book and print concepts. So emphasizing what the importance of books are in the classroom, the, um, the importance of the author, the illustrator, and different things that come within book and um, print awareness. So our fellows are also boosting in alphabet knowledge, so students' ability to recognize letters of the alphabet when they're seeing them, in addition to letters within their names, and um, strengthening their vocabulary and meaning in the classroom. So those are the five big early literacy predictors that we know to be backed by research, and we know that make a difference in a child's ability to be able to read, to write, to communicate. So on the other hand, we see the seeds qualities and we use this overall as a framework because it is research-based, it is evidence-based, and it is backed by so much data. And it's also used in several states already within the U.S. already. So before our fellows go into the classroom, they are undergoing um, training on our seeds curriculum so that they're learning how to be sensitive when they're in the classrooms. So that means that they're learning that students come to us with come to us with different abilities. So we're sensible of that so that we can work with them one on one. 
They're um, learning how to be encouraging within the classroom so that every interaction that they're having with their students, they feel encouraged by giving, um, by hearing positive praise and positive affirmation so that every interaction, we want them to come away from us feeling encouraged versus discouraged. Mm -hmm. So within that, um, the other E represents education. So everything that our fellows are learning in the classrooms and everything that they're learning within our training that we're giving to them, they're taking that into the classroom. So this is ongoing education experiences and training that they're getting twice a month to implement in their classrooms. And then the D represents um, development of skills through doing. So again, that goes back to what they're learning in our trainings and they're showing and modeling with the my turn first versus just jumping in and doing something that they want the students to do. They're modeling that first so that students get to see firsthand what this word is or firsthand what this letter actually is, what it says, what it means, how it's written. And that is also to um, aid in a student's positive self-image because we want our students to feel built up by us. Mm -hmm. And we want our fellows in the classrooms to help support that positive self-image for all of the students in the classroom. So once our students undergo the training that we talked about and they're still getting training twice a month, um, once they step into the classroom, the main goal is to build relationships with the students in their classroom. So we know that relationships are at the heart of everything that we want to see in the classroom. And if there's a positive relationship, students are readily able to hear what the fellow has to say, ready, readily able to engage with them when they're able to form those relationships. And um, following that building relationships, they also assess students. So we know that you guys, some of you are pretty data driven and want to see data. So we also collect data three times a year. So at the beginning of the year, at the middle of the year, and at the end of the year. So that helps us track student progress so we can see where students are ranging in alphabet knowledge, phonological awareness, um, vocabulary, and oral language. So we share that with our partners too, with the schools um, that we're working with so that they can compare this to the data that they already have to see if there are some, um, some similarities there or some differences and things of that nature. They're also targeting um, different interventions all together in the classroom. So with that data, they're able to see which students are ranging in the green and which students may not be in the green so that they can um, utilize more interventions in the classroom so that we can boost those literacy skills for the students who do need more support. And um, they're also doing interventions every day in the classroom through signing in, which is where students um, work with the fellow one-on-one -on -one in that experience to help write the letters of their name so that they're fluently able to see how their name is written. They're using scripts to hear how the letters are actually being drawn in the classroom. And we use all of that to monitor child progress again. So when we are looking at students who are maybe needing a bit more support, we wanna monitor that so that we're making sure we're giving them the support that they need in the classroom. And we're also moving around so that students who are boosting in those areas, they may come off of the fellows caseload so that students can come on who also need more um, support and more intervention. So they're doing songs every day. They're doing practicing, writing their names every day. They're hearing high quality read alouds and repeated stories throughout the week. So I am now going to pass it over to Dustin to hear a little bit about what he has to say. Okay. Well, um, I'm just going to briefly speak on why I decided to join the program and what the program has done for me over time. Mm -hmm. So initially, uh, to be quite real, I initially saw it as a form of a paycheck, but quickly did I realize how much the ideologies of the program resonated with me. Um, while being a Leaderman Fellow of the Literacy Lab, I also am a pianist finishing a bachelor's degree of music at uh, Morris Brown College. And as someone who has humanitarian aspiration, education plays a big part in that as opening schools in America, but in my parents' homeland, Haiti, is something I want to be a part of. So uh, being with the children day in and day out opened my eyes to see early childhood education as something monumental, not only for the children, but for my personal growth. And um, typically, like Coach Ario said, fellows are at the schools every day, day in and out, um, going through interventions such as sign-in, uh, transition songs, and high quality read-alouds. And sign-ins are typically ways that we get to spend one-on-one -on -one time with the children, having them write their names, practicing letters, everything. Um, that goes in regards to that transition songs now that has to be like the favorite kids love transition songs like transition songs are um songs that we sing when we want them to get to another task as far as like um lining up for lunch or uh laying down for nap time 
and these songs they they have a lot of uh educational value um they deal with letters uh rhyming numbers um alliteration alliteration um just ways that we can incorporate fun music and uh growth into them getting something done with a simple task uh, and read alouds and high quality read alouds are um, part of the days where I read to the children while teaching them words from the book and having strive for five conversations. Those are conversations where we typically want the uh, child to engage with to um, be better communicators at an early age. So uh, while doing these things on the daily, I really get to see how important it is to have a black male educated in the classroom. And that is why I continue to stick with the Liberty Lab. And I just wanted to thank you um, all for the opportunity to share my experience and thoughts on the program. One minute. One minute. Um, so quickly, um, as you see here, this uh, overall profile, um, excuse me, of our fellows, um, 18 currently uh, working in classrooms, um, and that's across 12 different sites. So um, elementary schools as well as uh, preschool sites. Um, and so that's uh, what we're doing now. Um, and looking to continue that going going forward. Um, right now, we're in the process of gathering, um, continue to gather data here locally. Um, but just to give you an idea of what we've seen nationally, 87% um, from uh, students grow, growing towards kindergarten readiness from fall to spring um, based on this program. Um, seven times as many students meeting that kindergarten readiness target than they had in the fall assessment. Oh, um, and then on the fellow side, 100% um, of principals interested in continuing to have fellows um, and 82% uh, of our fellows um, share they have an interest in continuing an education um, career. So this program is one that has definite impacts um, for students as well as our fellows. And again, we thank you all for the opportunity to share about that today. Very good and great program. Thank y'all. Thanks very much for being here. Very interesting. Yeah. Very good. Uh, the next group is the Science of Georgia. Science for Georgia. <laughs> we will give y'all equal time, so don't worry about it. Oh, so don't talk too fast? No, you don't have to talk real fast. Just talk fast. Just talk fast. <laughs> <laughs> But not like an auctioneer. <laughs> not like auctioneer. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> he's gone. <laughs> Sorry, I touched something on the screen. These science for Georgia is not good at Zoom. I tell you, we we learn we learn a lot about this stuff. This, this was that was a really good uh, presentation. very good presentation. Yeah. Showbun. And a lot of people care about this. You know, that, that's that's what's kind of blown me away. There's so many, so many groups and so many people that really care about children being able to read and that sounds pretty it's kind of a stupid statement on my part but i think it's really true yes ma'am introduce yourself and tell us <laughs> get going all right uh thank you all for having me here today my name is uh dr amy sharma i'm the executive director of science for georgia i'm also the mother of three children in the atlanta public school system before we get to the science about reading, uh, let me just talk about my children. I'm really smart. My husband's really smart. We're also very humble. Um, our, ch uh, <laughs> our children are pretty smart, um, you know, they, but they also have braces and glasses. So genetics is fair. But as parents, we are doing everything right. We read to our kids every night. We've talked to them all the time. They're all sorts of enriched. Their teachers are smart, professional, and care very, very deeply. And yet, because Atlanta Public Schools uses non-evidence-based literacy interventions, two out of my three kids struggled to learn to read. Um, between second and third grade, several of their peers always disappear into private schools because they are dyslexic and public school has failed them. Um, if we're throwing all the resources in the world at these kids and they're still struggling, imagine how that works elsewhere. Um, I'm going to put this up here again. You already know the stats. Um, in the past few hearings, I'm pretty sure you heard that only a third of Georgia fourth graders are proficient in reading. Um, all for Ed just shared even more depressing stats, but you can't send kids to college if they can't read. Um, so literate people are able to both read and comprehend what they read. Enabling them to read to learn is a skill set that sets them up for life success. This is why those who can't um, are more likely to drop out, right? If you can't understand what's going on in high school, why would you stay there and feel like a failure? 
And we all know being low literate is a strong indicator of being a low wage job, being in prison and perpetuating the science, the cycle. But we can science this. And I am not here as a mom. I'm here as an executive director of science for Georgia. And our mission is to make sure our science is taken out of the lab and put into practice. Uh, over the past two years, we've really gone down the rabbit hole of literacy. We hosted panel discussions, roundtables. We've interviewed a ton of people. I've read so many academic articles. Uh, we influenced and served on last year's HR 2650 Evidence-Based Literacy Instruction Committee. So I'm here to tell you some recommendations for success. But I also want you guys to remember, with evidence-based best practices, all people except those with severe cognitive disabilities can learn to read. I want to keep stressing that because I keep hearing excuses and all of them are wrong and lame. And you need to remember that. So uh, somebody asked me what an evidence-based best practice is. And for those of you that don't have a PhD and don't use this word every day, let's just, it's real simple. It's a generally agreed upon by researchers to be a practice that has been tested in a trial. So you have a test group and you have a control group. There are essentially the same demographically and everything else. The test group gets the intervention. The control group does not get the intervention. If there is a significant difference in outcomes, then you can say that this is an evidence-based best practice. It has to be replicated and it has to be in a peer-reviewed journal. So when everyone has been talking to you for the past four weeks about using evidence-based best practices, this is what they are. Um, also, we use them here in the state. Uh, Evidence-based best practices to improve reading outcomes are all along the pipeline, right? They're not just instruction methods. You just heard of a great uh, uh, program, right? That's a full-up program. That's not just instructional programs. But basically, anything that improves your language nutrition, which is the number of words heard in context, your access, which is anything that gets more people access to literacy interventions, positive learning climate, and teacher preparation. Okay. Evidence-based literacy instruction. Just to let you know, uh, there are five instructional components and they all have to work together to create literate individuals. If someone says they're just drilling people in phonics all day, they're doing it wrong. So how you learn to, so think about how you learn to read words on the page. You use phenomic awareness, which is one of those keywords people keep saying, and that's the ability to hear and manipulate word sounds, and phonics, which is the ability to associate written letters with spoken language. Have you ever watched a child learn to talk, right? First they make sounds, then they turn those sounds into words, and then they turn those words into sentences. This is exactly the same when you're learning to read. First you learn letter sounds, and then you learn groups of letter sounds, and then those become words and those become sentences. And then they have to practice, practice, practice. And those that practice have the ability, are said to have fluency when they can read text quickly, accurately, and expressively. But that's only half the battle, right? Once they can read that text fluently, do they know what those words mean? And that's where vocabulary comes in. They have to be exposed over and over and over to words and context by being talked to. And this is why you need teachers to understand evidence-based literacy best practices all along the pipeline, right? And in all subject matters, right? So when you're in a science lesson or a history lesson, you're also learning and using these techniques to give kids context. If you just batter them all day with reading and you don't give them reasons why they're reading or why it's fun or why it's fun to learn, they're going to just hate themselves and hate reading, right? So, but if you do all this and you braid all these things together, you have an individual who can read and write and understand it. So basically between uh, kindergarten and third grade, you're building your mental reading muscle. And then after third grade, you're learning, you're using your reading muscle to read, to learn. All right, so you guys want to talk about making it happen. Um, I'm excited to hear there's a bill dropping this afternoon. Congratulations. Um, because now uh, I had a mentor who always said, may all your problems be technical. And at this point, you guys have now reached the realm of funding fiefdoms and feelings. And that is certainly not technical. Um, you are in a realm of the cycle of blame, right? There are so many programs and points of intervention in this state. <laughs> and this is what's happening, right? When kids aren't ready in pre-K, they have bad parents. When they can't learn to read in K through three, 
their pre-K was terrible. When they can't read in high school, they had bad K through three. They aren't ready for the workforce. They had bad high school. Like, let's think about this. And then also local control. We can't do anything because of local control. And the pipeline is disincentivized to work together. And since no one is in charge and no one is responsible, they can all blame someone else for the abject failure that our kids are illiterate, right? So I'm sure you guys can break the cycle. We've been here before. In 2013, the deals created the Get Georgia Reading Center and the Deal Center. Okay. In 2017, there was a Georgia Literacy Commission. In 2019, the transition team made a bunch of recommendations to Kemp. And in 2022, the House Committee that I served on also made a bunch of recommendations. They were all the same. One, empower teachers. Improve teacher training and certification that focuses on evidence-based best practices, measures teachers' training outcomes, and provides follow-up support for teachers in the classroom. And second, pipeline coordination, right? There are so many amazing programs out there. None of them are talking to each other, and none of them are incentivized to work together. Oh. So getting off the hamster wheel. Again, this is not science. This is you guys. I'm feeling it, you guys. You guys can empower teachers. Um, I was super excited to hear Chancellor Purdue talk about reforming what teachers are taught, right? If they have the skills, they are equipped for success. Even if they are given the worst possible out of the box curriculum, they are still armed with a tool set that they can use to teach their kids to read. You can tell PSC and DECAL what teachers have to know. So I wish you luck in that. The second thing is coordination. This is hard. It's squishy. No one wants to be in charge and everyone wants to be in charge at the same time. <laughs> but at the same time, there are example instruction best practices. There are great programs going out there. And when I talk to programs that are doing well, they feel like they are alone and adrift in the sea without anyone to help them. Oh. And we have like 10 programs in the state already to coordinate things, which makes me sad. Um, so I'm going to tell you maybe why this should work and why we're stuck. Here's your theory of change for you. Bullock, which you guys heard from, Fulton, Marietta, they're all doing great things. They were out there. They're what you call the change leaders. That's 10%. The middle of the ground, those 100, what, we have 181 school systems in this state, they all have 99 other problems, but they really want to do something. So if you're not out there spoon feeding them with this is how you set up a community program and this is how you work together and this is how you apply for the funding, they're going to be too busy trying to make the buses run or feed the kids or pick up the garbage or pave their streets or whatever else is going on. And then I know 10% of the people just need to be voted out and we just have to move on without them. But since a only 30% of our kids are reading. I feel like if we reach 90% of school districts in this state, we're going to make a huge difference. So that's where you all are. And this is how you know when you've went. You guys keep talking about stats. These are the five indicators. Kindergarten readiness, fourth grade reading, eighth grade math, high schools, graduating workforce readiness, if none of our kids could read and all of them are leaving with high school diplomas, that means a high school diploma is meaningless. So you guys need to go back to a new measure. And then we need a post-secondary completion rate. So I'm over time. I thank you for your time, but we know what to do. And I give you guys huge credit and props for trying to do something. And thank you for making this a huge issue. Um, I wish you luck in the feelings, fiefdoms, and funding that you are now about to sit in. But the science is here ready to help you out on your journey. Thanks, guys. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Great presentation. Yeah, we, we're adjourned. Thank you. Great presentation.